everybody, everybody, man, I got a guy on the channel. He got a badge. He got the hat. He got the flag. He got pictures behind him. He's a, a, a park ranger for the National Park Service at one of them historical sites that we need to go to. And I'm not going to tell you which one just yet. I'm going to let him do it. But he is another one of the guys that, uh, you know, we've had several of them on the channel already. And man, they know what they're talking about. They historians. They not just, you know, tour guides. Well, I guess you're a historian of your tour guide because you know what you're talking about. But nonetheless, you get the gist of what I'm saying. I'm finding these people that want to tell this story, tell this, this good history, American history. And so uh, I'm thankful that you are tuning in to Strong Inspirations. You know, I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm the guy that find these people. And I asked a few questions uh, per what they talk about so that we got a clear understanding of the point they are trying to make. That's all I do. Uh, and hopefully I ask the question that you really want to know to the best of my ability. Uh, and so uh, I need you to do a favor for me, my friends, because I know you're watching me. I can feel it. Uh, hit the subscribe button to the channel. It's free. We don't ask you no information. It just let me know who's watching. And I and if I can, I'll send you a message thanking you for 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 subscribing to the channel. And and then hit the like button on this video because you're gonna like what this guy's got to tell you. I'm I'm t I promise you. He going to blow your mind and then uh, hit that notifications bell. Cause what that does is when I, I'm putting uh, maybe four or five videos up a week and, um, and you get uh, a ding to let you know that there's a new video on strong inspirations and then tell somebody about the channel. Don't keep this to yourself. I know it. Just tell them, say, Hey man, check out strong inspirations. S send them a video or something like that and, uh, and and tell them teachers too when school starts back up let them teachers know so the teachers can watch this in their classroom let's get this history out there we talk about a lot of times you know a lot of you know we our history don't get told like we should tell it or don't you know we don't know it or whatever man not no more not because of strong inspirations my brothers and sisters so do that for me the other thing I want you to do, and I, and, and I can feel that a lot of people are doing it because my sales are up, is watch my movie. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a historian, too. And the movie is titled Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It's, it's got some powerful, powerful information in it. It's 75 minutes long. You're going to really like this. I got interviews with people who family owned the business in the early 1900s and so much more. I got a guy who he starts and ends the movie. And at the time he was, uh, we interviewed him and had him, you know, taped him. He was 101 years old. You need to hear the wisdom this man shares. And it's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. The other thing, I, as you might know, cause I'm a really a historian. <laughs> I'm not no joker, I'm telling you, cause I wrote this book. It's titled Black Business Book, and it's got over 200 facts on the rise of black business in America, just like the movie, but it's, let's say it's a little more thorough and it's in written form. But because, you know, I want to give it to you straight, no chaser, I don't add no commentary. I let the facts stand as their own. And I trust you that if you don't learn nothing new in my book, I give your money back. No questions asked, because you are a smart person but share this information, all right? And the movie and the book, both are available on Amazon, uh, but you can also get them on my website, which is businessintheblack.net. So I really appreciate you doing that, my friends, because uh, that's how I make my living. I ain't gonna lie to you. You know, I'm sharing this with you free, but I love this so much that I, I think about it all the time. What, what kind of people can I put on it? What kind of subjects can I cover? And that's why I got this guy on the channel today because he got something that I thought about and said, whoa, who can I find to tell that story? Did a little research, found where he's located and he's about to tell you right now. So sir, go ahead and introduce yourself. 
Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and let's get it on Strong Inspirations. Okay, well, thanks for having me, Anthony. I'm a park ranger, John Heiner, and I'm the supervisory park ranger at, at Fort Davis National Historic Site in Fort Davis, Texas. Now you may say, where's Fort Davis, Texas? Uh, but think of far west Texas. Think of the big bend of the Rio Grande River. Uh, maybe you've heard of Big Bend National Park. And that's about a uh, hundred miles uh, south of Fort Davis National Historic uh, Site, and uh, about two hundred miles east of uh, of El Paso, Texas. Some of you probably have heard of El Paso and, and yeah. Fort Bliss. Uh, yeah, let, hold Fort on, Davis, you go any further. Uh, how you get to do what you do? How you like doing this, man? How do you how you get to be a park ranger and stuff? Oh, I I love being a park ranger. In fact, I've been a, a park ranger for almost thirty three years now. Um, I started out, you know, a long time ago to, to teach school. I have teaching certificates in history and earth science. So that's just perfect to be a, a ranger with the National Park Service. Uh, you know, we tell American stories and like you and I are going to do here in a few minutes. We're going we're gonna to tell some of the, the good American stories today. And, and that's what park rangers do. Yeah. We, uh, we, we're the stewards of the land and the history and in the cultures of, of the of the United States, you know. Okay, uh, love it. So, so you you uh you outside giving tours and and telling what's on your site uh to the people that come through, correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, Fort Davis, and we'll get get into it more. But Fort Davis is one of the best preserved southwestern forts in the entire United States. When you come onto the grounds of, of Fort Davis and leave the parking lot and work, walk towards the restored structures, you actually feel like you've stepped back into the 1870s and 80s. So, so it was never uh, uh, attacked or anything like that, that there was some damage to the, to the fort? Uh, correct. Uh, you know, time and, and weather were yeah. probably the two biggest enemies of the fort. Uh, soldiers from Fort Davis would go out and patrol and campaign throughout the area. Uh, basically, the road that, that Fort Davis is associated with is the San Antonio El Paso Road. And it's one of the best routes to the gold fields in California. And that's okay. why the fort was established. I got um, one more question on you, uh, for you, uh, let's say personally. What does, sure. what, what, and, and one of the things that happened at your site is some black history. What does that do Correct. for you as an individual to talk about that? Uh, is it the, the good and bad? I mean, does it, does it does it depress you at some point to hear some of the things or do you get beyond that and kind of immune to it how does that how does that work well well Anthony you know that that it really is a very complicated topic I'm sure uh, you know generally as a as a park ranger or a, as a historian my job is to, to gather all the information that I can all the primary information on, on any topic yeah. You know, and and filter through this uh, information and present it in a informative manner that people can understand and let that person uh, decide for themselves. I see. I like it. You know, I like it. I'm I'm not trying to to force my opinions on anybody. Now, personally, there's a there's a lot of stories out there in America. They're yeah. they're good and they're bad and they're ugly. Yeah. And sure, I think we sure. all can can agree sure. on that. Do, do you, know. you do you yourself have do you uh, do some research and I, and I know I'm sure that you, I know the answer but do you do some research yourself for your site or they just give you a manual and say this is what happened did, have you found some things like in the ground or something that they didn't know they said ha ah, man look at this since you've been um, there yeah you know as a as a park ranger when when you first come into the ranks yeah a lot of the information you're given is basically canned information yeah, yeah. that other researchers and historians have come up with. But, you know, and I've been at Fort Davis, I think about 25 years now, and I've had time to do my own research. You know, uh, we try to get as much primary information as we can, original yeah. documents and that kind of thing. Plus here at Fort Davis, we still have 25 historic buildings standing. Okay. You know, from the, from the barracks to the commander's house, to a hospital. To a commissary, so you know it, it's it's fun and and very educational just to go stand on the ground sometime in one area 
and think about, okay, who was here before me? Yeah, right. You know, and what what did they learn and what did they do and in that kind of thing. Okay, so now now what so you told us where you are. What is that? What happened at this fort? Okay. Give us a, a general overview and and, sure. and from particular, you know, from the black history standpoint. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I can lead into that. So basically in the, the late 1840s, they discovered gold in California. Okay. So one of the best travel routes across the southwestern United States is across this part of Texas on into New Mexico, Arizona, and eventually into California. Okay. Okay. So you start seeing a, a string of forts, like in, in Texas, for example. Okay, hold on, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. These people okay. are coming from where? Uh, all over the East. Okay. Um, you know, depending on the time frame, they could they could probably, generally San Antonio, Texas is kind of the starting point, okay? Okay. Because by this time, the, the train has reached San Antonio. Okay. So, so people could potentially take the train to San Antonio, and then start their journey from that point. Okay, but uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, accelerate past the American Civil War okay. up to the 18, late 1860s. Uh, the United States Army reorganizes at that point. And in this reorganization, they established six regiments of, uh, of black troops, okay, or soldiers. And two of these are cavalry, that's the horse soldiers, and four are infantry, that's the foot soldiers. And basically a lot of these, these men are stationed on the Western frontier, um, you know, like Fort Davis in Texas, for example, and, and on in New Mexico and Arizona and, and other places in, in Texas. Like I say, a lot of these are, are African-American troopers or, or soldiers. And uh, I think what we're probably leading into here is, is the nickname eventually becomes the Buffalo Soldier. Right. Correct. I got you. Okay. And generally, the Buffalo Soldier name or, or, uh, is, is more associated with the 10th U.S. Cavalry. That was one of the all black units during this okay. time. Okay. In fact, even in the crest of the 10th Cavalry is, is the Buffalo. Okay? okay. Now, as you and I know, there's really no written record where this name Buffalo Soldier came from. Right. Correct. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of assumed that this name came from maybe the Northern Cheyenne Indians that were stationed basically in Kansas, Nebraska, kind of the central United States. They had a lot of interaction with these, uh, with these black soldiers. They've never really seen black men in uniforms. Before. Right. Right. And uh, so they, a couple of things they equate the name buffalo with the black troopers kind of based on the, the hair on their head and plus their tenacity to survive and oh, battle you. as a, I as a worthy you. opponent i so, got you so that's kind of where that and, came and from. at your fort yep. um was there uh black only white only segregated correct living conditions um, and things like that so it was in 1867 that the ninth, actually the ninth cavalry came to Fort Davis and these are horse soldiers too. And they, they reestablished Fort Davis and uh, all of the enlisted men, the soldiers, uh, you know, enlisted soldiers were black men. And then the officers were, the commissioned officers were white men. Yeah, I heard uh, that. Anyone that knows, you know, military etiquette and what have you and uh, knows that the corporals and sergeants are, are non-commissioned or enlisted men. And those were black men. Um, but the, the commissioned officers at, the, at this time were, uh, were, were white men. Uh, now this went on for 14 years at Fort Davis. You know, all the enlisted men being, being of African, uh, African Americans. And then for the next four years after that, it was African Americans and, and white soldiers, but they're still segregated into their units. Right. or into the regiments. It, in fact, it wasn't until 1948 under Truman that the United States Army was, was integrated. Is there, um, uh, are, the, are the conditions, uh, with like living conditions, the quarters, so much more inferior for the black soldiers than they are for the, the, the white soldiers or the, the, uh, the superiors? Um, well, you know- Smaller beds, smaller rooms. You know, here's, here's the, here's, 
what my research tells me, okay? Yeah. So they, they've come out to, to Fort Davis, Texas to reestablish Fort Davis. They get here and it's basically nothing but open desert, okay? <laughs> so everybody's living in a tent, you okay. know, until they can get, get the buildings put together. Now, the first building they always build on a military post, as far as housing goes, is the commander's house, you know, because he's the top dog. So they had the men, actually they hired, hired contractors to come build a lot of the officers' houses, but the, uh, the soldiers themselves did build their barracks, uh, you know, and they, they build them out of adobe bricks out here. Adobe is basically a dirt block is what it is. Um, you know, the quartermaster, he's, he's trying to get all the supplies out here he can, the beds, the, the foot lockers, the, the tables, the other furnishings, the foods. Uh, you know, these men are making $13 a month. That's pretty much the standard across the Army for enlisted men. Uh, you know, one of the things I find kind of interesting, we, we talk about inferior uniforms and, and, and rations and clothing and, and equipment. But you have to keep in mind the army during this time frame, they were they were still fairly frugal. They said, yeah, we have all these new regulations on what everybody's supposed to have, but we have all this stuff left over from the Civil War. And until it's all, all issued, we are not going to give the new stuff to anybody. Uh, how many, how many, uh, again, I, and this, uh, maybe you know this, how many Indians were like right around there that they had to clear out? It's, it's, it's a thousand of them sitting over in that pasture over there. We got to go clear them out. Yeah, uh, you know, more or less in, in this part of, of Texas or the what we would consider the Apache Nation. I got you. The, the population was pretty thin, uh, probably nowhere even close to a, a thousand. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, it would just be small pockets, you know, a lot of times when we talk about, about Apache, they, they travel in, in family units and it's everybody from the, from the babies to the women, to the, uh, the warriors, to the grandparents or the elders, elderly. And that may only be 30 or 40 people at the most okay. because that's all the land can support, you know, in one area, you know, it's pretty rugged desert out here. If you don't know where to find water or, or the, yeah, right. the plants that can uh, sustain you, yeah. you know, you're, you're not going to last very long. In yeah, fact, sure. the army learned that pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> now, is there, could, could there have been another way to, to, to deal with the Indians other than just forcefully telling them to go? Could there be, was there ever any negotiation to say, hey, man, we're bigger than you now. I mean, you got one or two choices. We can fight you and get you off of here, or we can say, and really what they wanted to do was for them to go to Oklahoma, right? Well, that's that Oklahoma was Indian territory, but but New Mexico and Arizona both are big reservation states too. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the Apache, the Navajo, uh, among other tribes. Okay. And basically, you know, Indian policy, and I'm, I'm by no means a, a, a big scholar in Indian policy. Sure, sure. But... The idea was to get them on the reservations, you know. Uh, you know, there were many, many treaties signed out there between the, you know, United States government and the various tribes. Uh, I mean, even, even some of the jobs of the army was to protect uh, the various Indian tribes against poachers and people trying to come onto the reservations and, oh, really? and, and take their resources, you know. Uh, Okay. What well, what about you know, that? The, was there um what well, did the Indians ever try to you know go on the uh, uh, offensive and attack the fort or something like that or attack uh not not so much the forts, okay? Like I was saying these these um well uh, the Apache who I'm the most familiar with, they traveled in family units. So, you know, you have 10 or 15 warriors where they're not going to go to a fort. Yeah, right. Is, yeah, right. There's right. 300 soldiers with guns. Yeah, right, you know? right. So they're 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 raiders, okay, and opportunists in in a sense. Uh, the the Apache, for example, they're 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 working these roads too, uh, looking for easy pickings on these wagon trains, you know. Uh, 
And that's who the army is, is protecting, the travelers using the roads. Well, you know, the, the Apache can easily overrun these slow moving wagon trains. And, and what's in these wagon trains? They want food, water, you know, other things. You know, the things that you and I want. What do we, what do you okay. and I need every day? Food and water, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Is there is there a movie that was written uh, that that gives you some idea of what happened at Fort at, at Fort Davis or something like that? Was there a John Mo Wayne movie that said this is kind of what happened here? Um, not so much about about Fort Davis in particular, but about the the Southwest and and the uh, forts of the Southwest and interactions between the Army and. Uh, Oh, you know, the Apache and the, and the Comanche and, and yeah. some of the other tribes. Yeah. Did, 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 did you all have to do anything? Uh, or maybe this is uh, before, you know, before the itself. I'm not sure my, my history timeline to deal with Mexico and the Mexican uh, uh, battles to, to claim the land of Texas and so on and so forth. Uh, well, the, the history of Fort Davis is really a little bit later than that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, the Mexican-American War, or uh, wars was basically, I think, what, 1846 to about 1848. Okay. Uh, Texas is already part of the United States, you know, in 1845. So, um, you know, it's part of the big Western expansionism of the United States. Uh, really, the, the policy between the United States and Mexico during this time frame, at least military policy, like, and it's, and it's interesting that the, the Apache knew this, that uh, we could not cross the Rio Grande River and go into to Mexico in pursuit of the, uh, the Indians, you know? And the Apache knew that. They didn't maybe know why, but they knew one thing, if, you know, the American army, army, army chases them to a certain point, and then if they cross this river, then the Mexican army, army start chasing them, you know? Mm. <laughs> they kind of knew that, where that dividing line was. Oh, uh, what, what, were there some uh, famous, uh, well-known people at Fort Davis uh, that, you know, maybe the general that people have heard of sure. or somebody else? Uh, yeah, you know, probably the the most uh, most famous uh, commanding officer here was a, a Colonel Benjamin Grierson. And, uh, he basically uh, was a, a Civil War hero, hero on the Union side. Uh, he basically uh, ran the, the, the interference for uh, the Union Army in the South, uh, so the so the uh, Union Army could take Atlanta and, and some of the other major cities. He was basically out there, uh, you know, causing havoc to where uh, uh, Grant and, and the other generals could could do their job. You know, he was he was keeping the focus. Uh, off of off of Grant and those guys. Okay. And then you said uh, Henry Flipper came there, right? Yeah, I, I want to definitely want to talk about Henry yeah, Flipper. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to start from the beginning. Yeah, please. Come on. Yeah, heck yeah. Um, Everybody be quiet. Well, he about to talk about this man. Okay. <laughs> Let's yeah, go. Uh, so Henry Flipper uh, was the first uh, African-American graduate of West Point uh, you know, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point graduated as a second lieutenant. Let me stop you right there. Where is West Point? Uh, in New York. The West Point York. is in New York. Yes. West Point is a military academy that's just the top of the top, right? That's where they train the officers, where okay. the majority of the officers. Okay. I, I believe, and, and I know there's some others that can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe uh, each state in the United States is allowed to Two, two uh, students or, or uh, officer candidates in West Point every year, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure there's some, some West Pointers out there that can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe yeah, yeah, that's sure, 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 sure. But anyway, Henry Flipper was born a slave uh, and, and he had, a, I think he had some other siblings too, but anyway, he was born a, born a slave. And what was interesting about him uh, or his family his mother belonged to one master and his father belonged to another. Okay. Now, his father uh, was, was a skilled man. He, he, he uh, repaired carriages, you know, wagons, and he was also a, a shoe cobbler, a shoe repairman. Okay. So 
his his uh his owner allowed him to earn money and give it to his owner to buy Henry Flipper and his brother and his mother. So uh, his, his Flipper's daddy's name was Festus and his mother's name was, was Isabella. Okay. Well, basically his, his father was able to earn enough money repairing shoes and, and working on wagons and what have you to, to buy his family. So to get them back together. Right. So, uh, so the Flipper family's together. Uh, one thing about, about uh, Henry is he's able to go, go to school. He's able to get some education. And as you know, it was for the most part illegal to, to yeah, teach right. black people to read and write, write during right. this time. Right. So he, he's getting this, this education. Uh, the Civil War ends, and uh, Flipper's parents are, are fairly well, well to do. In fact, uh, you know, Atlanta is so de devastated after the Civil War that, that um, his mother actually opens a restaurant uh, to help feed people. And of course, his dad has his skills. Well, Flipper's parents can earn enough money or making enough money that they, they hire a, uh, a Confederate captain. Well, he, he was killed in the Civil War, this, uh, his widow, mm -hmm. to educate Henry and his, his brother. Right. So you have this this white widow educating these, these black children. Okay. Okay. And uh, so just to kind of move the story along, uh, what eventually becomes one of the universities in Atlanta, uh, Henry is accepted into this university, and uh, but he really wants to be in the United States Army, and so he he writes to his congressman, and of all names is. This congressman's last name is Freedman or Freeman. Okay. And uh, Henry writes him and, and says, Hey, you know, uh, can you, uh, would you, you give me your, your one uh, appointment to West Point, you know? And, and Freedman writes him back and says, Well, why should I give it to you? I've got a lot of people that want this. Um, you know, how can you prove yourself to me that I should, should give you this, uh, this appointment? So, Henry writes him back several letters back and forth, and and eventually uh, he says, "Okay, God, you can take the test. There's there's written test and there's physical test." Right. And he does very well on all of those tests, and he gets accepted to West Point. Mm -hmm. So, what I find really interesting about Henry Flipper, at least at this point in his story, here's this this young man that was a slave in 1865. Still had some basic, you know, had some basic education, but not a whole lot. Right. By, by 1873, eight years later, he, he's appointed to the military academy in, in, of the United States at, at West Point. Right. You know, right. just think about how dedicated and much work he had to do in those eight years. Sure. To, to reach that, that, um, that goal. Yeah, you know? sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, you want me to continue, or do you have a question? Yeah, yeah keep or? going. Yeah, let's, let's get him get him to the Fort Davis. Okay. So he goes to West Point. He's not the first enrollee, uh, African American enrollee there. He's the fifth, and uh, he basically uh, spends his four years. He's kind of on a um, kind of on an island in a sense because none of the white students would really talk to him. Because if they, they talk to him or interact with him a whole lot, then they get ostracized too, you know, by the by the other students. Um, so eventually he, he does graduate in 1877, and he's uh, 50th out of about 70 some odd students in the school. So he does, they say he's above average student. He's, he's a very good student. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's trained as an engineer. He learns learn Spanish. These are some of the main, main things they teach at West Point. And of course, the military aspect. So at that point, he's assigned to uh, Troop A of the 10th Cavalry and he goes to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Now, Flipper is, is basically a civil engineer. That's one thing he learned. And there's some uh, stagnant pools of water there that won't drain. And there's a lot of mosquitoes and it's causing malaria. malaria. Okay. And the uh, and the commander says, uh, Flipper, I want you to figure out how to drain those, uh, those, those uh, ponds over there, you know? So he says, okay. 
So he's a surveyor too, civil engineer. And so he, he comes up with this ditch that drains them. And actually he, he builds a ditch in the, in the dry season and, it, and there's an optical illusion. It looks like they're gonna drain. They're not going to drain. It looks like it's uphill the way he's okay. dug these ditches. And the, and the commander just chews him out over this and says, you know, we, we give you all this training and you can't even dig a ditch that goes downhill, you know? But the rainy season came and all of a sudden all these ponds just drained just like we had them, uh, oh. them designed. And, and even today, uh, these, this is at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. The, these uh, ditches are known as flippers ditches. Or flippers oh, really? Ditches. Okay. So now this is almost, okay, we're about to Fort Davis, like you asked. Yeah. Uh, next thing, you know, uh, Colonel Grierson, as the regimental headquarters moved to uh, Fort Davis, Texas, from uh, from San Angelo, Texas, so Flipper comes with him, of course, and they make Flipper the uh, the regimental uh, quartermaster and in charge of the commissary. So basically, in charge of the food supply here at Fort Davis. Which which and makes this, feeding how many people? Feeding how many? Uh, well, it was the regimental headquarters, so. They probably 500 or more okay. living here on site. Yeah, okay. soldiers and civilians included, okay. you know. And and this is kind of was Flipper's demise where he, he got himself in trouble, you know. Uh, he yeah. was he was trained as an as an engineer and a surveyor, and and, uh, and he spoke very fluent Spanish, you know. But he wasn't much of an accountant, okay. <laughs> So he had to keep the books on the on the food that was brought in, sold, and you know inventory and all of that. And, and you know, officers in the army during this time frame, the army didn't provide their food; they had to buy their own food. And where are they going to buy it? The only store in, in the, this part of the world, you know, at right. the commissary. Right. And right. The paymaster paymaster didn't always show up, so these guys would buy food on credit. And they were supposed to pay back at the end of the month. And a lot of times they didn't have the money. And right. You know, all those stories. And yeah. So long story short, Flipper's doing the books and he's about $3,000 short. Yeah. Money. And so anyway, Flipper's like, oh man, what am I going to do? You know? And so he, he falsifies the record. He tries to write a check on a bank that doesn't exist. Uh, he lies to his commander that everything's okay. You know, he's a, basically he's a, what, a 22, 23 year old kid and he's scared. Yeah, you know? I can imagine, yeah. You know, his commander is his Colonel Shafter that's, that is described often as one of the, the harshest, you know, so, uh, officers in the army during the time. Yeah. And Flipper is just, just scared to death, uh, you know, in fact, uh, it might be a little bit of sidetrack, but he, he writes an autobiography uh, and has it published, and he's trying to use this money to pay this debt back before anybody finds out. Yeah. You know? Uh, but anyway, he's brought up on, on two charges. One is embezzlement, and the other is, is, is basically lying to his superior yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this comes to a, a court-martial, and... Um, they they don't charge him or don't convict him of the embezzlement, but they do charge him with with lying to a superior officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the punishment for this is uh, this dismissal from the army. Uh, and uh, his uh, the the army reviewed it and they didn't recommend it, but uh, the president of the United States, uh, Chester Arthur at the time did go along with the, uh, with the sentence and, and he was dishonorably or, or dismissed from the army. Yeah. Well, you know, Flipper always thinks of himself as a soldier. I mean, think way back to the beginning when he was trying to get this commission. Right. West Point, you know, so he spends his, uh, the rest of his life, he lived to be 84 of all things. Uh, that's pretty unusual for someone during his time frame. But uh, anyway, he, he, he tries nine times to get this, this overturned, yeah. and failing every time. Because this has to go all the way to the, uh, you know, to the, to the Congress and the Senate of the United States to wow. basically get legislation to overturn it. Yeah. You know? yeah. 
But anyway, uh, like I say, Slip, uh, Flipper passed away in, nine, or in yeah, 1940. And uh, in uh, 1976, I believe it was, there was a, a school teacher in Georgia that ran across this, this story of Flipper. Yeah. And, and him and, and others uh, worked and campaigned, and, and they actually got the Army to reverse Flipper's dis, uh, discharge to an honorable discharge. Yeah. And then as late as 1999, under President Clint, Clinton, um, he was actually pardoned. For, for his crime. Oh man, beautiful so, story. At the end, anyway. Yes, sir. It, and, and too bad Flipper wasn't alive to, to see this. But I want to back up just a little bit. Yeah, As all a right. civilian, you know, Flipper was a very successful successful civilian. Also, okay. Uh, he, uh, you know, he was like I said, he was a, he was trained as an engineer, he was right. a surveyor. Right. He spoke right. fluent Spanish. I mean, he had all these skills. And he used those for, for various things. He worked for a mining company in Mexico. Uh, he did a lot of mining engineer, engineering. Uh, he, you know, it's kind of funny. He's dishonorably discharged from, from the army, but the Department of the Interior of the United States, the people that I work for, yeah. uh, actually hired Flipper as an associate uh, director basically to help yeah, um, yeah I love it I love it you know because of because he was fluent in Spanish he was able to help the United States government with Mexican affairs yeah I um, love it he was able to help with the with the uh, Alaska purchase okay you know so I mean he's a very successful man yeah you know? but he always thinks of himself as a soldier yeah and man. that's what he wants to be yeah you know yeah. And so, you know, finally he is he is uh given an honorable discharge. Yeah, and, 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 and his death. Is there is there a monument there at the fort in his honor or pictures of him or something like that? Uh there's there's several pictures of him. Uh actually in our museum we have a a, a whole section, you know, on Henry Flipper. Oh really? And okay. We, and we do have a a, a, a you know a, a, a bust of him. In our museum, also, but we do tell his story. Um, okay. So one thing I would really encourage everyone to do is, is to go to the Fort Davis National Historic Site website. Oh, for sure. And uh, you know all these stories I've been telling you about Flipper and about yeah. the Buffalo Soldiers here at the fort. And uh, you know I know you even had a program once on on uh, Seminole Negro Indians. Yes. Scouts. Yes. Um, you know, they were associated with the fort at one point. Um, yes. I know we're about out of time here, but, uh, yeah, but another great, interesting story on uh, on African Americans in the in the frontier Indian Wars Army is the Medal of Honor winners. There were 18 Medal of Honor winners. Oh, really? Was, okay. You know, not all of them uh, served at Fort Davis, but uh, you know, I, I think there were were 14. Uh, enlisted men, uh, you know, African American enlisted men, and then there were four uh, Seminole Negro Indian scouts that they got a medal of honor. So I'm, I'm going to leave got, that. We got another more minute. They would get a medal of honor for what? Bravery, bravery and courage. Uh, medal of honor is the high, highest honor in the military. Uh, it was established uh, during the Civil War, and uh, basically, you know, just some some quick stories. Uh, you know, some of them rescued their commander. Uh, they would okay. be under fire. The commander gets separated. They would go in and rescue him. I got you. Uh, there's, there's a story of uh, of some that were protecting the paymaster wagon had like twenty eight thousand dollars in gold in it, and uh, they were protecting that under oh, attack. Oh, I got you. I want to leave those as teasers. Yeah, yeah, we're going we're going to come back at it. But uh, yeah. hey, uh, you've given us a ton of good information. Uh, everybody on strong inspirations. This is what we do. We find the people to tell the stories, and I just try to ask a couple of questions and let them do it. And you did it so eloquently. I, I appreciate you Thank for you. coming on the show, uh, everybody. I want you to hit that subscribe button because you see what we're doing. Hit like this video. For sure. If you don't like no other video on the channel, you need to like this video. Uh, hit that notifications bell when the video comes up. 
tell somebody about strong inspirations. And to you, my friend, I want to say with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. We love what you're doing. We're coming down there to see you. I promise you, because I like the hot weather and I don't mind. I like coming through Texas and all that as I do my travels. We're coming down there. And let me ask you one more question. Is there a festival or something that you all have there to, uh, you know, like a big open house day or anything like well, that? We, we have in the past. Um, we haven't oh, had it in recent years. Yeah. We haven't had it in recent years, but the town of Fort Davis has a big Fourth of July celebration. Oh, do they? Okay. And 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 we participate in that. Um, okay. You know, that's some other things we we try to do at Fort Davis is as much living history as we can. You know, okay. Put on the period clothing and and tell the stories of the people that were here. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stay in touch, everybody. Let's go down there. And so uh, I thank you for being on the channel. Uh, bye bye. We out. Okay, thanks for having me. Yep, thank you.